it doesn't take the most observant person in the world to realize that shit's fucked up. I mean, we have uh, political tensions, uh, tensions between all kinds of different belief systems and you know, every community that you can imagine. Um, so this can make you depressed and feel like everything's fucked. And so there's no point in trying to improve yourself or your circumstances. However, I'm going to be examining two books that can kind of contradict some of these beliefs about our circumstances. On the one hand, we're going to see if from an objective standpoint, if things really are as fucked as they seem, and then, and that's the Rational Optimist by Ridley, and we're also going to examine more of a philosophical component of this through Mark Manson's Is Everything Fucked, where he says that essentially you could argue that everything's always been fucked, and so this should actually be a liberating truth in the sense that you can find meaning in a way that you see fit, see most fit for yourself. In the past 32,000 years, the population of humanity has multiplied by 100,000% or, th or 3 million to 7 billion people. We have colonized every habitable spot on the planet and explored almost all the inhabitable ones. For better or worse, we have made a greater impact than any creature on Earth. Is this because of our brain size? Not necessarily. Neanderthals, after all, had bigger brains than we do. Our incessant progress as a species is due to our ability to rapidly learn and exchange through culture. Quote, exchange is to cultural evolution as sex is to biological evolution. In the middle of this century, it is estimated that there will be 10 billion people on the planet. <laughs> that's, an, that's an increase from less than 10 million. Some are still suffering from extreme poverty and misery. Some suffer more some suffer for more than a few months or years previously. However, most humans are better off today than their ancestors have been. We have more access to clean air and water, food, shelter, electricity, information, reasons to get upset on the internet, and entertainment than ever before. It's estimated that in New York or London, you can buy 10 billion different kinds of products. One may have rose-colored glasses and think that the past was a much simpler time. However, if we look from 2005 to back to 1955, the average human earned nearly three times as much money, ate one third more calories, and lived a third longer. The rich are certainly richer, but so are the poor as well. In developing countries, the poor doubled their consumption compared to the world in 1980 and 2000. Since the 50s, absolute poverty, living off a dollar a day, has fallen. In Africa, in America, those who are officially considered poor, quote, 99% have electricity, running water, flushing toilet, and a refrigerator. 95% have television, 88% have a telephone, 71% a car, 70% air conditioning. According to the United Nations, poverty has been reduced more in the past 50 years than in the last 500. If you're more pessimistic, you might say, but, what it, but at what cost? If everyone's consuming all this crap, doesn't this affect the environment? It certainly does. If you're up to me, it'd be nice to use other forms of energy instead of stalling dictators in the Middle East to give us access to their oil, but that's for a future video. However, as far as energy goes, alternative energy, such as wind and solar, is promising. Today, a car at, all, at full speed emits less pollution than a parked car did in the 70s. But what about inequality? I mean, Jeff Bezos spending half a billion dollars on a fucking yacht makes me want to tweet about it on my iPhone and rage. If we look at income inequality in the past two centuries, it has declined in both America and Britain, but has paused since the 1970s. While inequality has increased in some countries, overall, globally, it has declined. Inequality has also been on the decline in another way. The gap in IQ scores. On average, IQ scores improve 3% per decade. It could be argued that IQ isn't the most effective way to measure intelligence, but it is an indication of things improving. Justice is improving as technology improves. DNA evidence releases the falsely accused and finds the real culprit. What about time? 
You know, everything is such a fucking hassle, particularly if it involves paperwork. If the New World Order really wanted us all to be complacent, they should just chip us all, so that way we never have to deal with any tedious bullshit ever again. So, if you think shit's a hassle now, it's significantly less of a hassle than that of society a century ago. A half a gallon of milk costs 10 minutes of work in 1970, and only 7 minutes in 1997. And keep in mind these figures may vary if they're closer to today. The Rational Optimist was published in 2010. A three minute phone call from New York to Los Angeles was 90 hours of work for as far as average wages in 1910. Today it costs less than two minutes of work, and actually probably even less than that if you have a monthly plan. In the 50s, it took a half hour of work to get a McDonald's burger. Today it's three minutes. So if your grandparents say how everything was cheaper back in the good old days, they're full of shit. However, you're still getting skull fucked as far as healthcare and education go. Those are more expensive today than in the 50s. As far as happiness, material success only goes so far. There's more happiness in societies that will allow for individuality, choice in lifestyle, or live, career, sexuality, etc. You get the point. Statistically speaking, life is pretty fucking good for the humans fortunate enough to have plenty of access to food, to food, internet connection, and Pornhub. So if, if we listen to teenagers scream about how the collapse of the environment is the fault of the boomers and what a burden they place on our generation, we might be under the impression that we will be boiled alive by the toxic farting cows and their CO2, turning us into crispy, a crispy bowl of chips for the cosmic reptiles of the universe to devour us. On the other hand, there's young people like Boyan Slant who develop systems to rid the ocean of plastic. Ridley argues that protection of the wildlife and environment often gets sidetracked by the emphasis of climate change by opportunistic politicians. Take the pollution of coral reefs, for instance, in which ha over half a billion people depend on for food. So you're telling me I don't have to eat bugs in order to save the planet? No, you don't have to eat bugs to save the planet. You can eat your tasty Baconator and enjoy it too. What about disease, AIDS, cancer, nuclear war? We made significant progress in these areas. I should suggest you give Rational Optus a read to find out how. So it's likely we're stuck here with each other. So while we're on this Cosmic Dome reality TV show, there might be some philosophies and strategies for us to make more meaning while we're here. Mark Manson notes that if he were to work at Starbucks, he would put the following on a cup instead of the customer's name. One day you and everyone you love will die and be on a small group of people for an extremely brief period of time. Little of what you, do, of what you say or do will ever matter. This is the uncomfortable truth of life and everything you think or do is but an elaborate avoidance of it. We are inconsequential, inconsequential cosmic dust bumping and milling about on a tiny blue speck. We imagine our own importance. We invent our purpose. We are nothing. Enjoy your fucking coffee. The universe doesn't care about the kind of school we get into, whether or not we die by a disease or getting hit by a bus, the latest sex scandal of a celebrity or politician, the results of an election, rioting protesters, or if beings from another dimension uses our planet as a berry for a cosmic smoothie only to shit us back into the dark void of the cosmos. The existence in which we find ourselves may seem hopeless. All one needs to do is watch the news to see that there's some pretty fucked up shit in the world. Hope is our mental fuel for us to continue onward. Hope is what gives us purpose. If someone has an unclear life purpose, what this says is that they're unclear about what gives them hope. It should be of no surprise that the religious suffer less from suicide and depression non-religious. However, your sense of purpose could be secular as well, such as trying to help the environment, being financially successful to acquire something you desire, a relationship, a family, or having a career that's of service and makes an impact in some way. From a material standpoint, we are more prosperous than ever before. 
we have more access not only to things, but information as well. So then, how do we explain how all these affluent Westerners lose their fucking shit on Twitter? We've made so much material progress, but are anxious and depressed. Quite a paradox. Although we've reached an all-time low in extreme poverty, decrease in child death, and a decrease in violence worldwide, we still face an increase in stress, anxiety, depression, and a decrease in social trust. We are the most safe and prosperous humans to live in the history of the world. And yet, quote, the wealthier and safer the place you live, the more likely you are to commit suicide. How do we feel worse in a world that is, quote unquote, improving? The idea of reason being the supreme virtue goes all the way to Socrates, then Descartes, then Kant, then Freud, but with dicks involved somehow. We believe that everyone should use their reason to dominate their more animal or shadow instincts. Those who are addicted to food, smoking, or drugs, that aren't legal for that matter, are seen as <clears throat> failures of self-control. People with depression and suicidal leanings are, but in this, are built into this category as well. Well, if you tried just a little harder, so maybe you wouldn't want to blow your fucking brains out. Inversely, we praise those who, through working 140-hour work weeks, 100-mile runs, sleeping under their desk, and not seeing their wife or kid for weeks, the self-help industry exists because it is built upon the premise that you want to change yourself. And as it turns out, self-control is more than just willpower. Our brain is not just a single entity, but a right and a left. The left brain is analytical and is concerned with logistics. The right brain is concerned with holistic stuff and emotions. Self-control is not just something that can be thought into, but an emotional problem. Emotional problems are harder to solve than strictly logistical problems. If you're in financial debt, you can spreadsheet that bitch until it's paid off. However, there's no spreadsheet for toxic relationships or a crisis of conscience. A rational understanding of our behavior isn't enough to change our behavior. To make real progress, this requires some negotiation between your feeling brain and thinking brain. It's important to recognize we aren't completely rational. So we need to use positive reinforcement to ultimately get what we want. It's difficult to work out, lose weight, uh, quit a destructive habit, etc., because the emotional part of ourselves has so much power than the rational part. As Manson points out, we don't have self-control, but we do have meaning control. Young adulthood is a time when many of us struggle to find an identity. I know that I certainly did. This is why many ideological movements seek to recruit the youth for their ends, whether it be QAnon or social justice types. When we're on our own in college, we don't have an authority figure telling us what to do. So if we fail to perform in class or at work, it's difficult to admit that it's on us. Ideological movements and cults capitalized on how lost we feel and give us a sense of purpose. People are especially vulnerable at the low point of their lives. If their biblical God fails them, they look for a worldly God. If society fails them, the new identity is a rebellion against it. Today it's even easier than ever to advertise whatever form of snake oil with social media. Just say a bunch of crazy ass horse shit and let the algorithm do the rest. However, it can't just be totally incoherent schizophrenic nonsense. It has to be coherent and tap into some sort of collective vision, frustration, or desire. You can get people riled up about anything, but to have an effective social movement requires giving people something to hope for as well. We have faith in a lot of things. For instance, that the audio, lighting, or exposure won't fuck up too bad when recording these videos. Even if we identify ourselves as having rational and secular values, we still have faith in something. To someone who has faith in money, they see everything in terms of the dollar. They believe that they need to make enough money to get the car, to get the house, and status to get love from a partner. Someone may have faith in love, and so they do everything they can to make sure everyone gets along and there's no conflict. But paradoxically, sometimes conflicts need to happen in order to, in order to work out the tension in a relationship. This is healthy. 
People can use anything to have faith in. However, there are three main categories of things people derive their values from. Spiritual, the ideological, and interpersonal. In previous centuries, life was a great deal of suffering. A plague could wipe out a third of humanity. It was most likely that you were going to be a slave or a serf. And it was unlikely you would see any improvement to your circumstances. People used religion as a coping mechanism. Believing our behavior in this life would lead to a better, more pleasant spiritual afterlife. Spiritual and religious belief systems give hope for our everyday lives as well as the afterlife. Ideologies such as capitalism, communism, fascism, environmentalism, etc. promise concrete benefits in this life for society and you as well. If implemented, economic theories can be tested. You can compare how countries like America run with their healthcare system compared to the Scandinavian countries, for instance. However, ideologies typically take a few facts and make generalizations with them. Lastly, we have interpersonal religion. This could be making an icon out of a musician, athlete, politician, public thinker, etc. If you like to learn more about ideological and cult dynamics, I suggest my videos, what is Marxism and capitalism, and how to create a cult in five easy steps. Mark Manson has this to say about ideologues in all forms. If someone could really solve all your problems, they'd go out of business. Leaders need their followers to be perpetually dissatisfied because it's good for the leadership, because it's good for the leadership business. If everything were perfect and great, then there'd be no reason to follow anyone. No religion would ever, will ever make you feel blissful and peaceful all the time. No country will ever feel completely fair and safe. No political philosophy will solve everyone's problems all the time. True equality can never be achieved. Someone somewhere will always be fucked over. True freedom doesn't really exist because we all must sacrifice some autonomy for stability. No one, no matter how much you love them or they love you, will ever absolute will ever absolve that internal guilt you, you feel simply for existing. It's all fucked. Everything's fucked. It always has been and always will be. There are no solutions. Only stopgap measures. Only incremental improvements. Only slightly better forms of fuckness than others. And it's better and it's time we stop running from that and instead embrace it. This is our fucked up world and we are the fucked up ones in it. End quote. That last quote by Manson really hit me. Um, you know, I mean, saying, I don't think that he's necessarily saying that everything is, is fucked literally and that there's, there's no hope so much as we, if we acknowledge that there's a degree of suffering for existence and if we change our perception so that way we don't suffer as much and then this helps others not su uh, suffer as much. So it kind of takes, because at face value can be a nice nihilistic thing to say that everything is fucked, but it kind of takes enlightenment, uh, sorry, it kind of takes nihilism and spins it on its head into a more, I think, complete um, look at uh, human existence. So that concludes today's video. I am Parker Tebow of Focus Shift Media. Um, if there's any topics or books or anything like that you think would make a good commentary or edit or montage in the future, then feel free to submit those down in the comments or connect with us on our website. Our services are also available on focusshiftmedia.net. We offer edit, uh, not only video editing and Photoshop and 3D graphics, but also some camera stuff as well if you're somewhere in the New England area. All right, that's, uh, that's it. I'm signing off. Stay groovy and stay wise.